Hey, everybody. It's five minutes after, so we'll get started here in a moment. <coughs> Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name's Aislinn. Nice to meet you all. Um, before we get started, I would like to give a brief thank you to our sponsors. Um, our uh, title sponsors today are Amazon and Capital One Cafe, Delphur Startups, and the Downtown Denver Partnership. This session you're at is part of the design track, sponsored by Battery 621 and the Public Works, one of eight programming tracks aimed at supporting the entire entrepreneurial team. And by attending this session, you're agreeing to follow our code of conduct, as well as being photographed or rec recorded on video. Uh, be sure to share your experience at this session online using hashtag Denver Startup Week and um, at handle Fudo on T. Uh, let me catch you guys up. Uh, so yeah, thank you to our sponsors. This wouldn't be possible without them. So let's dive into Tea Meets Tech, how Japanese tea ceremony creates beautiful UX and UI. Uh, so, again, my name is Aislinn. Um, can everyone hear me okay, by the way? Thumbs up, mic's good. Thanks. So by day, I'm a lead product designer at Scenic West Design, where we provide product design and product management for your next big idea. And by side hustle, I'm the founder of Food on Tea and Wellness. Um, so I started my tea business as a way to help employees find peace in their busy work and life balance. And I now bring tea ceremonies uh, and matcha education to pretty much any event or venue. So my timelines of when my story began with Japanese tea ceremony uh, or Chanoyu, as you'll he hear me refer to it uh, today, and UX and UI are synonymous. Not to date myself, but I found Chanoyu in my first year of college at Penn State University, and I'm still studying with my teacher 11 years later. Uh, so like a martial art, one can study this art form for many years and still have a long way to go. And similarly, as designers, we are constantly adapting and learning in an ever-changing technical landscape. Around the same time I found tea in college, I began my journey through... No, we're good. <laughs> um, so I've, around the same time I found tea in college, I began my journey in the startup world, uh, taking me from New York to LA to Denver to remote, building my knowledge in product and UX design along the way. And it was in these years that I started to see synchronicities between these incredibly different but complementary worlds. And I'm eager to share that with you today. So I'd like to preface with some goals of this talk. So one, I'm not telling anyone how they should approach UX and UI. I'm also not telling anyone how to perform tea ceremony today. But I'm gonna show you how we can find modern concepts in old rituals and how knowing the rules of tea ceremony and uh, as a tea practitioner can enable the intuition of the designer and vice versa. And with any luck, have you geek out uh, on some UX with me. Sound good? So I'd like to begin by laying the groundwork uh, with some definitions so we can establish a connection early on. What is Chanoyu? So, Chanoyu is Japanese tea ceremony, the art of making matcha. Originating in the 16th century Japan, it's the ceremonialized method of preparing matcha or powdered green tea and was formalized by Senno Rikyu, our grandfather of tea ceremony. Rikyu emphasized the concept of wabi-sabi or rustic beauty and that all things are unfinished, imperfect, and temporary. Um, and that this art form should be accessible outside of the royal and the upper class. Today we still study his principles of harmony, respect, uh, purity, and tranquility. And most importantly to remember is that each ceremony will never occur again and must be appreciated in the moment. The tea room was used for diplomatic, political, and business relations. For this reason, it was one of the only places samurai would remove their swords. The tea rooms are a special place where time, status, and your qualms outside the walls do not exist. 
So it turns out this is a great lesson in studying user empathy and aesthetics. Next up, what is ritual? Webster's defines ritual as an act or series of acts regularly repeated in a set precise manner. For example, a simple act like brushing your teeth can become a ritual by prescribing a philosophical framework around a disposable moment in everyday life, but we'll get more to this later. So what is UX UI? Just gotta, gotta do it while we're here. Uh, the ergonomics of human system interaction defines UX as user experience includes all users' emotions, beliefs, preferences, perceptions, physical and psychological responses, behaviors, and accomplishments that occur before, during, and after use. And secondly, user interface includes all components of an interactive system, software or hardware, that provide information and controls for the user to accomplish specific tasks with the interactive system. And all that's to say that you may be well aware of this already, but I just want to be sure you stay with me when I start crossing into the T-Realm. Uh, essentially, UX is an umbrella term with UI just being one facet that us UX designers study to accomplish our goals, along with user research, graphic design, visual design. So, <laughs> as UX designers, we're familiar with user flow diagrams. This is an example of a simpler tamai, or tea-making procedure, called hakobi usucha in the summer season. Uh, this is a relatively simple uh, tamai example, if you can believe it. Uh, but here you'll see mapped out every action of the host, including decision points and dialogue, interacting with the guest. So if the tea ceremony is the product or the service, think of the host and the guest as personas interacting with it. The guests being the users everyone is working to create the best experience for. There are other potential personas not covered today, such as uh, the Hansho, the Mizuya helpers, and just teacher-student lesson scenarios, which all have their own procedures and formalities. But to keep it simple, we're just analyzing the host and the guest here. The point is to show that we can map rituals the same way we can map user interactions with products. So as UX designers, we're trying to make a product part of someone's ritual. And naturally, studying one ritual can help us understand what makes interactions meaningful to users. So why does ritual have gravitas? Why study it? Uh, well, they have structure and they impact those who participate. So rituals are a way of eliminating chaos. Uh, in Barry Stevenson's ritual, a very short introduction, the effervescence, solidarity, and communitas that at times accompany collective rights hold disorder, entropy, and chaos at bay, establishing meaningful and purposeful interactions with others. So in his book, Stevenson also lays out the goals and domain definitions of ritual are widely debated among scholars, so we're not gonna go down that rabbit hole. But what they do is fairly consistent, um, including but not, uh, so yeah, the things that are fairly consistent uh, are but not limited to repeating the action, prescribing and regular, regularizing the details, and performing the action with a special attitude. Um, and in Japanese tea ceremony, there is intention with every action. Each movement informs the next. There is a reason you must adhere to the sequence or everything falls apart. And as UX designers, are we not finding efficient ways to guide the user to the path of least resistance? So you remember the flow diagram from before. Let's take a closer look at instance A, what happens when you don't do something in the right order. Uh, so I know this is hard to read, so I'll just read it aloud, but uh, it says you place the kettle lid on the futaoki or the stand, you place the fukusa behind the kensui, then you take the cloth and you put that on the kettle lid, and then you pick up the scoop and scoop hot water into the bowl. So removing the lid enables us to set the cloth on the lid. Everything touching tea must be sanitary 
and not touch the floor. So now we can put water in the bowl. If we don't, the bowl won't be preheated. There will be nowhere for this cloth to go. It'll have to go on the floor. And most importantly, the bowl won't be preheated and additionally warmed for the tea and the guest. Empathetic thinking. So in tea lessons, we're humbled when we falter in the sequence of a tamai uh, and usually have to back up a few steps to figure out not just where things went wrong, but why. Just have to hit next on my slide, one sec. <laughs> okay, thank you for bearing with me. Oh. Okay, so in describing root cause analytics, Donald Norman says, when searching for the reason, even after you have found one, do not stop. Ask why that was the case, and then ask why again. Keep asking until you have uncovered the true underlying causes. And this is from the author of The Design of Everything, Everyday Things. Great book, highly recommend it. So it's not enough to solve problems for the sake of solving them. Asking why we got here and not assuming we know everything is something a beginner's mind allows us to approach problem solving open to all answers and possibilities. So now that we've laid the foundation of what connects ritual and UX, uh, let's apply these ideas to a more tangible concept delighting the user. Bear with me, my controls are swapped now. It's gotta come over here. I guess I have to do it down here now. Okay, the ultimate user experience, Omo Tanashi. So, Omo Tanashi is basically uh, the ultimate hospitality in Japanese culture. Tea is a form of art that nurtures an ever-expanding circle of human interaction, as opposed to thrusting one's own ego in people's faces. I can't make this up. This was written in the 15th century Japan by one of the head uh, ceramicist family of the Raku family. So when you're invited to a tea ceremony, you will experience a culmination of the host's understandings of Japanese food, art, philosophy, and tastefulness. It's hospitality with a capital H. A tea gathering usually takes weeks to prepare for, spanning hours serving your guests sake, a nice kaiseki meal, and finally tea. But throughout the experience, there's a correspondence that takes place, transcending the simple acts of accepting food and tea. It's the host pouring their heart into the movements and bringing your focus into the here and the now. As my tea teacher, Drew Hansen, has said, in the West, hospitality tends to be viewed more like a cordial extension of amenities to a visitor, uh, more than expressing something deeper, something more profound. So for certain, the ceremony is a ceremony of unity between the hosts and the guests, between the mind and the body, between imperfection and beauty. Which brings me to human-centered design. There's a lot we can learn in practicing empathy, and Omotanashi shares some roots with human-centered design, one being empathy or the human-first approach. So this is the capability of understanding another person's experience and emotions, obviously, but you need to put yourself in the user's shoes and ask questions to determine uh, what products they're currently using, why and how they're using them, and the challenges that you're trying to solve. And as UX designers conducting user research, we have to come up with very particular questions and methods to extract exactly what people want out of a product. The sooner we figure out what someone's pain point is, the sooner we can design a solution. 
Human-centered design suggests that we can speed up the validation process if we just let the desires of the end user be the anchor as we design features and products. So a couple examples. Um, when I plan a tea ceremony, I'm thinking for days about my guests, what they want, what they like, what is happening in their lives, and this helps me craft the best experience possible. Some examples uh, we can see in the tea room. Like I mentioned in the flow chart, we warm that bowl with the water before the tea is served so that not only is it warming their hands, but it's making the tea taste better. Um, we also put a cloth underneath the bowl in the second picture to make sure the bowl isn't too hot for their hands. And we uh, choose a theme of the actual ceremony itself, whether it be a birthday or a celebration. We might choose some wares that are favorable or delights the, the guest, um, making sure the water and the room and the temperature is comfortable for the guest. It's all thinking about giving them the best experience in that moment. All right, so we talked about UX. If you're still following me after all of the elusive examples, great. If not, maybe you'll like something a little more tangible. Uh, let's move into UI and see the pieces that build the experience. So building a strong UI in the tea room. One obvious, uh, whoop, there we go, connection. Uh, consideration that we as designers uh, take is the color palette. So working with a style guide, for example, we try to complement a brand as much as possible through its primary color, secondary color, uh, and through thoughtful placement and emphasis of those colors. In tea, we ut utilize colors to make the guest's connection to nature and highlight the season. So before the tea room, the guests walk through a roji garden which you can see here, that leads them to the tea house. It's basically the portal from the real world into the tea space. Taking this time to leave any worries or concerns at the gate, the guest actually experiences a reduction in their stress hormones by looking at the color green. Um, and along with the garden, color is also important in the kimono. Uh, Japan has seasonal color palettes that uh, are favorable in the tea room and should be considered when choosing your outfit for hosting or attending a ceremony. Uh, so it's usually pretty bright and colorful in the spring and summer months and then drops down to cooler, more subtle hues in the winter and fall months. This is all to just uh, highlight the season and pay attention to what time of year it is. And uh, lastly, uh, the wares we choose should pay homage to the season the best that we can. At the very least, they should complement each other, and that can be done by choosing a theme um, or just wares you like. You kind of just do the best you can. Um, if This is a relatively light and summery one, but uh, you can see that there's nice greens and pink pastels, and if you have it, use it basically. Moving on to example two, balance. So balance is a bit of an abstract concept, but one we try as designers to always consider. I think of this when I am wireframing or creating lo-fi designs, laying out a page before plugging in all the details. Creating balance and order is incredibly important from the beginning, uh, from the fonts we use, uh, to the buttons, and what border radius we want our buttons to have. All things should work together and not be overwhelming, essentially. So speaking of border radiuses and shapes, an interesting thing, I just gave away my next slide, but that's okay. An interesting way we create balance in the tea room is also in the wares we choose. Uh, rounded or square edges impact how we display utensils, uh, like the tea scoop you see on the top of this table here. Um, in this example, you can see that we turn it up on a square shelf and turn it down on a circular one. Can anyone guess why? Want to, to draw your eyes in a specific way? 
draws your eyes in a specific way? Maybe. It's a good answer. The, let me jump to the next slide, maybe that'll help. On a circular shelf, we want to create balance by turning it upside down to create a rectangular shape. And likewise, on a square shelf, we turn it up to highlight the circle or roundness of the scoop. So it's about creating balance and harmony. It's subtle, you have to use your imagination a little bit, but that's the concept, is to you know, create balance with your edges. Uh, similarly to selecting our components, in a tea room, we actually wouldn't use a tana in anything, a shelf, anything smaller than a four and a half mat room. Uh, these are pretty large and vertical, so they take up a lot of space. There are other larger pieces we simply wouldn't use in a small room, so it doesn't feel cluttered. This is to create harmony and balance in, the, in your room. Whatever wares you choose, it's important to not choose the same ceramic or repeat the same motif. Things should subtly work together. So these are just a few compositions of um, wares that you see aren't repeating, but they work together in harmony. Um, and the third way we practice balance conceptually um, is actually yin and yang. So this pops up a lot in the tea room. You actually can kind of see a ode to that here. But uh, one example is the fukusa or the silk cloth that every host uses. Women typically use a red one and men use a purple one. And this is because red is a yang or fire color and purple is a yin or water color. We switch these for the genders to create balance. Just a kind of high level conceptual one. Okay, so this one is fun. Uh, alignment. So my background in web design is gonna pop out here for a minute, but so I just wanna point out that how we place the utensils often overlaps with flex box arrangements. Uh, you can see that we have flex start, flex end, flex center, stretch, and baseline. Um, what we're seeing here is a baseline example, so centering or I'm sorry, a centering example where the center of the objects all align and create harmony. And we do this in different compositions digitally and um, in this room to make the space appear balanced. Um, so this way of creating space and harmony obviously looks nice, but it also lends a great instinct in aligning objects both in the digital and the physical realm. Do. Here are two other examples. Um, in the tea room, we're doing center alignments across this placement. I know that it's not perfect aerial shot, but the idea is that they're all center aligned, as well as our kettle and our tea water jar. You can see all of the instances where flex is happening. Moving on to centering alignment. So, uh, the next set of examples are less universal and just mere observations that help me remember and enforce different concepts. So the first concept of using centered placement to suggest elevated states. So in the text here, we center text to convey short, meaningful words. Think our H1s, our H2s, et cetera, for a few reasons. Uh, one being that it breaks the typical F-shape pattern that we gravitate towards on websites uh, when we read requiring more work on the user side. So because of this, headlines demand your attention by also being front and center of your eyesight. So because you're working to read them, they subconsciously slow you down for a moment to pause and process them, even if it's a millisecond more. So we use centering in the tea ceremony too. While asymmetry and wabi concepts are ever present and usually favored, there are a few callouts where we display elevated utensils or themes by centering. Two examples I'll speak of are both occur in the tokonoma or the alcove that is displayed here. Um, in a set of tamai called the kazaris, 
We choose a special object that holds a connection or a story between the host and the guest. And before the guests have tea, they are displayed in the center of the tokonoma on a purple fukusa. As soon as the guest enters the room, they see it featured and know there will be something special going on. Uh, when we aren't doing kazari, typically you see this kind of arrangement. Uh, there's just featuring f seasonal flowers, incense, and a scroll. Uh, so here you can see the scroll is very long, so we place the flowers to the left. And if we have incense, it usually sits to the right. This is just the default. However, there are some special scenarios where we see centering, um, such as celebrating special occasions, so uh, where we have a horizontal scroll or a yokomono. They are a little more formal, and in this case, we can place the flowers in the center and use special vases for this, et cetera. Um, so why, there we go. So why do we associate the center with elevated intent? Aside from it being the focal point for your eyes, there's an, there are interesting theories around the architecture of the tea room. In this diagram, you can see that there are many divisions related to feng shui and yin and yang that we don't have time to dive into today, but the point being careful consideration is made when orienting the tea room. The red square I highlighted in the corner is where the tokonoma or the alcove would be. And since this is in the north side of the tea room, it already associates it with the deities, making this space an altar of sorts. So looking at traditional Buddhist altars, there's the concept of ko, ge, and to, incense, flowers, light, and candle. Traditionally, the incense offering goes in the middle. For tea, we have, I can actually show you. The left is a Buddhist altar, the right is a tea ceremony alcove. Traditionally, the incense goes in the middle, and for tea, we have the flower, or the water on the left, our incense or fire on the right, and this leaves the middle associated with the north deity, hence making things formal or holier. And this was a great uh, talk from Alan Palmer Sensei on numerology and just how that shows up in the tea room. A lot of Chinese uh, numerology and astrology show up here just based on history and how it was developed through the, through the years. Lastly, space. So how many times have we relied on the inspector to figure out how much padding something needs? The last connection I'd like to mention is space or padding, a key principle that can fix a design immediately and letting things breathe as a concept. In tea, we always make sure our hands can place objects down gracefully and that they're situated far enough apart that our kimono sleeves won't uh, bump them. And funnily enough, we also tend to count in multiples of eight, much like we do for fonts and padding increments. Uh, for example, to orient ourselves when making tea position, uh, we count 16 tatami weaves on the mat. And without going too far down a numerology rabbit hole, the number eight has great significance in Buddhism as well, and many cultures, really, but appears many times in the tea room, so it informed old measurement systems and is still very auspicious today. Now, I could go down a rabbit hole for hours talking about why widescreen resolutions uh, have been developed in 16.9 format and why we use eights, but, um, I think, really, there's no direct connection, sorry. <laughs> Nevertheless, these synchronicities help me remember and are still useful parallels to fall back to. Correlation does not equal causation, moving right along. So lastly, measuring success. Like any product, can we measure success of the tea ceremony? The answer is yes, but it's not as retrospective as you might think. Uh, so at the end of the day, 
Rick Hughes summarized the secret to hosting a tea gathering was simple. Lay the charcoal so it doesn't go out, boil the water, and make a decent bowl of tea. Rick Hughes' disciple criticized him for this simple explanation, claiming that he could do them easily. And Rick Hughes replied that he would well become his disciple if he successfully completed all of the above in a single gathering. It's harder than it looks, basically. So after a gathering, the host watches their guests leaves, leave, takes a moment to reflect uh, while making themselves a bowl of tea, watches the guests go away, and asks themselves, did I execute every motion with harmony, respect, purity, tranquility? Did I do my best to adhere to Riku seven principles? And maybe the host will hear from the guest what they thought about the ceremony someday, but that's honestly not the point because nothing is expected in return. The performance of the tea ceremony is measured in real time only once the host and the guest meet each other in the present moment. Because of this, the host truly has the guest or the user's experience in their, as their purest intention. Ritual places meaning on the mundane and UX, likewise, appreciates that every mundane action has a significance and a meaning in a greater scheme. Studying ritual builds empathetic design skills, tea ceremony just being an example of one. Remember that while much can be learned from emerging technologies and strategies, there's a wealth of uncovered information and hints sprinkled throughout history. That's all I got, and one more plug before I leave is um, Scenic West. We're hiring remote UX and UI designers and product managers. And also, I'm accepting tea ceremony inquiries if you ever want to experience this beautiful art. Um, please come take cards and stay in touch, and we do have some extra time, so I thank you for listening to me for an hour. <laughs> We do have some extra time. If there's any questions, I'm happy to take some. Yeah. Could you repeat the four principles, harmony, respect, tranquility? The four principles are harmony, respect, purity, and tranquility. Yeah. Yeah. How was I introduced to tea ceremony in college? Um, I was part of a tea institute, and we brought in teachers from all over the world. And one of them was my teacher, who was an alumni to Penn State. So through that, I just kept attending after I graduated. It stuck. <laughs> Any others? Yeah, so can you create a correlation between any ritual and UX? Precisely. I think that with any set of predefined movements or actions, there's something to be learned there. And the gravitas of why someone is doing a ritual, I think, has some interesting layers worth exploring and studying as a UX designer that can uncover a lot of empathetic design practices. So, yes. All right, if that's it, thank you guys so much. Come take a card and keep in touch again. Have a great day. <laughs>